Hello everyone. Welcome to NPTEL Groundwater Hydrology and Management course. This is week four, lecture three. In this week, we are continuing to see the important components for groundwater hydrology. In the last class, we looked at porosity and how it changes and affects the groundwater movement. We understood that uh, specific yield uh, and specific retention are a function of the porosity or depends on the porosity. Uh, and also we looked at how the water can move through the porous space and then draw down due to gravity. And some materials would keep the water uh, along with it. The solid particles would cling on to the water and that would be your specific retention. In today's class, we will look at permeability. What is permeability? We can define it as the measure of soil's ability to allow or permit water to flow through its pores or voids. Something like your conductance in electricity. Okay? So you have a material and how is the material allowing water to pass through? The material is your soil, rock particles, etc. In hydrology, we call it as the matrix. The matrix is, is the arrangement of soil, solid, soil, uh, and other particles. And through the matrix, how does water flow? Uh, and how does the matrix allow the water to pass through? And that is uh, called permeability derived from the word permit. If you search permeability, you might uh, find that the uh, word spelling uh, is different in different terms. So uh, you can have uh, both uh, spellings in different books. Okay. Moving on, uh, you have a loose soil. So let's see how a loose soil will differ from a dense soil. Uh, in a loose soil, loose means the solid particles are loosely bound. Okay, And there is a lot of space in between. And you could see that water can move through easily uh, through the material. In other words, the solid particles permit the water to move freely. Just by looking at this, you can also know that this property is also a function of the porosity and the function of the material. You could manage the porosity or manage the permeability by compacting or tilling those kind of activities. Uh, but uh, just for a soil you can take, you have an uh, intrinsic value or dependent value uh, based on the material. So in a loose soil, uh, water can easily flow and it is called high permeability. In a dense soil where the particles are densely packed, closely packed, the porous space is less and because of the porous space is less, the permeability is less. So in a dense soil, it is difficult to flow the water uh, due to the low permeability. So let's take a very uh, microscopic view of what is happening. Uh, note that Q has units of velocity, which is length time in dimensions okay it is not actually a fluid velocity and, uh, you, you can uh, understand that it is not actually the fluid velocity even though it's meters per second or centimeters per second you don't call it a velocity it is the ability of the material to allow the water how fast water can pass through uh, but even though the units are say similar to velocity it is not the actual fluid velocity Okay, uh, just take this example and you have Q is the discharge going through a cross section of a block A. This is a macroscopic view. In that you can say, okay, this is a velocity. So you have Q going in, it, it has Q coming out. Uh, you have a car going on a river, uh, on a road, uh, it goes through the road and uh, a cross section can be put to see how fast it goes. That is velocity. However, in fluid uh, material and in solid uh, soil material, your uh, water doesn't take the shortest path. You can see that the path is tortuous or it goes around and round until it finds the 
easiest way to get through. So why not water go up? Because the solid particles are jammedly packed, water won't go up. So it might come down. So the uh, understanding here is it is not the straight line that the water will take. Okay, it has to maneuver, meander, and then go which way uh, is least um, um, you know resistant. You can see that behavior in rivers also. You don't see the rivers. Uh, straight, you see them curving up and down, up and down, depending on the resistance uh, to flow. So the water particles would go through the path where it is least resistant and it need not be a straight line. So it is not a linear velocity, but average linear velocity. You can average it out, uh, take out the noises uh, or it is the pore velocity because it depends on the pore space, the space in between the material, uh, it is called pore velocity. Okay, and it is given as V is equal to Q by N E. Uh, Q is the uh, velocity uh, of the, uh, um, or, or here we define it as uh, the average linear uh, velocity is V. And the pore velocity can be taken as V, whereas your Q is your permeability, uh, and also Me is your effective porosity, which means the fraction of connected pore space in the medium. So you can have pore spaces. Okay, uh, let's draw it here. You can have pores uh, spaces in between the material, but are they connected? Okay, is, is, is water seeing them as connected uh, through the pore or is it seeing it disconnected? Okay, so for example, you might have a, a pore space here, but water doesn't see it connected. How much of it is actually connected is the matter. Okay, so you can have like this materials uh, and uh, water cannot pass through. So because of that, it has to go through like this. And that is a kind of meandering torturous path. Uh, so your effective porosity is the fraction of connected pore space in the medium. It is also a, a function of your uh, soil material uh, and also the management practice. If you till the soil, for example, there will be more connections. And that is why you see uh, before irrigation, farmers normally till the land. Okay? They plow the land. Uh, and so when they apply water, it quickly passes through. If they don't, what happens is water stays on the top, slowly it infiltrates and leads to groundwater recharge. Uh, but what happens is if it is on the surface too long, it gets evaporated. So the farmer is at loss if they don't use the water carefully. So coming back, uh, we are at NE, which is effective porosity, i.e. the fraction of connected pore space in the medium, in the matrix or soil. Um, and it is uh, uh, a, a good function uh, to be uh, noticed, which is a property of the soil particle. Then we move on to another very, very interesting, uh, very important relationship between uh, the uh, permeability or intrinsic permeability is intrinsic to the property of the material. So uh, it is given as uh, K rho G by mu is equal to big K. And K is called the hydraulic conductivity. It is function of both the matrix and the fluid. So this is the first time we are bringing water into the picture. So, so far we talked about it is the function of the matrix, the solid particles and how they are arranged. Uh, but this uh, parameter, which is hydraulic conductivity, uh, brings in the properties of the fluid, the fluid being water here. Uh, and please understand that there could be any other uh, motion um, uh, within the ground. It could be oil, it could be petrol, uh, whatever you want to call it, crude oil um, or soluble uh, salt, etc. Chemicals. Uh, uh, so all these would have different velocity, uh, different high conductivity based on the density. And that property is only held by the hydraulic conductivity called K. So how is K defined and how is it related to the permeability? K is equal to small K or hydraulic conductivity is equal to the permeability times the fluid density 
times g which is the gravitational acceleration uh, divided by mu okay and uh, you have mu as the fluid viscosity uh, so all this fluid uh, can be put for water so we have uh, if you're using water for groundwater understanding uh, groundwater for uh, recharge etc we put the values for water and it becomes the rho is water density and mu is water viscosity so look at it here it is not only the ability of the soil or the solid particles to allow water uh, but also the reaction or the interaction between the solid and the water so fluid density is very very important thick uh, water cannot pass uh, that easily it has to be fluid enough and the viscosity can actually drag so if the fluid is highly viscous then your solid particles will tag on to it and will not allow the fluid to pass through so here is where you have a fluid viscosity coming into the picture so now density of water can also change depending on the composition of the water so if you have a very salty water the density is different compared to a fresh water which is recharged uh, through rainfall uh, and the fresh water when it stays with the rock material long enough many many decades or years you have uh, a salt which is dissolved in the water and the fluid uh, water density and viscosity does change okay so now when we rearrange this equation uh, you get k which is uh, intrinsic permeability or just permeability is your um, hydraulic conductivity by mu okay so mu uh, uh, hydraulic conductivity times uh, mu by rho g so what you have here is uh, just rearranging the terms uh, and you get the units of uh, intrinsic permeability okay let's do the units uh, to just uh, check if we are doing it uh, correctly when we look at some examples of values but before that uh, we need to understand all my diagrams till now all the book diagrams also you see one dimensional movement either it is left to right or right to left okay uh, like for example pure sand particles are easier for water movement because water passes through easily the pure sand has uh, a high uh, uh, effective porosity uh, which means the fraction of pores which are connected is very very high okay uh, and if you come to a sand clay mixture uh, as you see here you have sand the same sand with clay and uh, other particles inside um, then what happens is the pore space is there but it is not well connected uh, it is retarding the movement of water which means stopping the movement of water uh, and that is not uh, good uh, for the intrinsic permeability uh, because the effective porosity is very less so you could see water flowing from here in this screen uh, right to left uh, and in the previous examples we saw water moving from left to right uh, but is it one dimensional is the question is it just x y uh, plane or can we introduce another plane uh, yes for sure we do need uh, to understand that water actually moves from vertically down and then goes horizontally so there is three dimensional movement of water and on the three dimensionals these properties would change so now we are converting one dimensional into a three dimensional problem so water can come along the uh, z uh, plane uh, or it can go to zx or zy okay so all these planes are important for movement of water you cannot restrict it just to one dimensional it is a three dimensional movement so uh, and the process uh, and the forces acting on these would also change so for example if water is moving in the previous way left to right uh, which is after it reaches a uh, the activity of gravity doesn't affect your intrinsic permeability uh, nor your hydraulic conductivity so the gravity is there but it doesn't readily uh, pull uh, more however when you have it vertically moving okay you cannot neglect the gravitational force because that is what is pulling the water 
and uh, in this case what happens is the water is actually stored in the saturation level through gravity through gravity there's more water coming in so when more water comes in it has to dissipate it has to move laterally so gravity also plays here indirectly uh, but more uh, force would uh, directly act on the vertical structure so let's look at the values and the units uh, for hydraulic conductivity it is units of velocity uh, which is uh, given as meters per second whereas your uh, permeability it is a centimeter square okay. or it is called darcy so darcy invented these terms so he has his name associated with it we will look at darcy's experiment in the coming lecture uh, Darcy uh, is given after his name, the unit. So Darcy is equal to centimeter square times 10 power 2. Okay, so you can see just a magnitude or of order difference uh, here. So the small k is permeability and the big k is hydraulic conductivity. So please note uh, that uh, we need to understand uh, the hydraulic conductivity properties uh, in detail in the coming class, but we'll look at permeability and how it uh, shifts. So this uh, values I've taken from Freeze and Cherry, which is uh, uh, a book on groundwater. Uh, the authors are Freeze and Cherry, and they are very, very well known across the globe for groundwater work. And uh, this book is kind of used like uh, the uh, rule book in many, many uh, groundwater research institutes. Uh, and the data they have has been be validated. So I'm using the same thing here. Here on your left hand side, what you see is the type of the rock or the deposit or soil. So this is more your soil type and whereas here it is more of the rock type because groundwater can go in and go into the soil structure and can also come down deep into the groundwater, uh, deeper aquifers where you have more rocks. So groundwater equations can be used as per the depth change. So let's look at a particular uh, value and how to use this uh, conceptual uh, data. So you have uh, all these different uh, uh, rock and soil properties. Uh, what you can see is a range. If you understand previously, even for porosity, we did not give you one value. We gave a range of values. Same way here, you have a range which starts from, let's say, silt, uh, okay, let's say silty sand. It starts from this point to this point. Okay. So all this throughout this is silty sand. So first you have to understand what is your rock material or your soil type. Go to the soil type, okay? And then you can look at the range. Let's look at the range of permeability here. It is a centimeter square, okay? So from 10 power minus 10 uh, centimeter square to 10 power minus six is the range. Okay, uh, 10 power minus four orders of a magnitude difference. So you can pick anywhere you want. Uh, I normally pick the center value because it's kind of averaging out the uh, other values. Um, and like this, you could apply it to different, different uh, data. So since K, which is uh, your hydraulic conductivity is a function of your permeability, where the other terms are just your mu, and uh, uh, viscosity, uh, uh, the density, uh, and also your acceleration due to gravity, all are constants for water. You can quickly do the calculations to get at K, and that is what this graph does it. So 10 power minus nine, uh, let's say, is kind of the average I wanted to take, centimeter square, uh, and that equals to approximately 10 power minus four, centimeters per second uh, or 10 power minus 6 meters per second or in other units uh, 10 uh, uh, gallons per day per feet square. So you can see there is a volume uh, uh, of water moving through a cross section and if you take off the area of the cross section it is purely a velocity kind of a relation. Let's take a centimeter square. So the permeability is 10 power minus nine for silty sand, uh, not uh, very slow, but not fast either. Uh, and you could see that fast, when you want to look at the word fast for groundwater movement, you could look at hydraulic conductivity, which is your K. Uh, 
because it is almost in length per unit time. And when you see centimeter per second, what you see is water takes that long to pass through a silty sand. Okay. Uh, if it is um, very, very, uh, you know, uh, fast medium, let's say uh, uh, gravel, you can have it as 10 centimeters per second. So think about water and a gravel bed. If you pour water, water will move through the medium, through the gravel bed at 10 meters per second. If you want to uh, apply this to a real life scenario, let's take the cricket pitch. Okay. And if you see a rain is coming, they quickly run and cover the pitch. But uh, before that, the rain has already started and water has come on the field. But as soon as they take the cover, you see that the rain is not much affecting the pitch or the grass. Why? Is because they have under the uh, pitch and under the grass a very, very highly hydraulic conductive soil. It could be a mixture of gravel uh, and sand and silt where water, when it goes, it just flushes through. Okay. So quickly you lose the water, which means quickly you uh, keep the system dry. In other, other sport, you see this is golf. Golf uh, courses are, are made like this. And that is why it's very expensive, these sports to maintain the greenery and also the water budget. So when we say water applying to picket pitches, uh, it's a lot of water because it has to first give water to the grass, but also it flushes very fast in the system. These are the same concepts that you would use when you are constructing a vertical uh, farming or a uh, farm on the rooftop because soil is there, you apply water, water has to go through. Uh, but excess water has to rush out uh, through the uh, system, otherwise water will clog and leak into your building. So you have to understand the hydraulic conductivity of the soil uh, and how fast water can move, whereas permeability is the uh, how much uh, the material can allow the water to pass through. Okay, so you have different materials uh, here, and I would assume uh, all the materials in the world are represented by these uh, simplified versions. Uh, you can either find it as a silt sand, or you can either find it as a rock. Let's do a quick comparison. So silty sand can also correspond to a metamorphic rock or fractured uh, igneous rock. Okay. Um, it can also be part of a permeable basalt. So uh, the uh, basalt is what is present in uh, most of India, uh, along with your fractured rocks, when you call hard rock aquifers. And this is what the rock is present. So the silty sand values also correspond to your uh, permeable uh, basalt and fractured igneous metamorphic rocks. So if you're using a groundwater model, the first things it will ask, is it water? Uh, the second thing is, uh, uh, is it uh, a, um, uh, what is the soil property? What is the soil type of soil? And what is the hydraulic conductivity? Uh, so even though there is a range, if you don't give the range, it will get the average value. So be uh, careful about using hydraulic conductivity values in your model. So let's look at uh, hydraulic conductivity in detail. Uh, we can rearrange the equation to give uh, the previous equation to have K, which has dimensions of meters per second or uh, length per time. Um, and it, it actually is equal to K is equal to minus Q by A dH by dL. Uh, what is dh and dl? We will look at it uh, in the following slide. So basically the equation uh, uh, is a measure of the fluid. Initially it was measure of permeability was measure of medium and how easy it allows. But here we're going to do it as a fluid example water uh, and how it can pass through a porous medium. So the image is the same because uh, in the previous uh, discussion we looked at the brown particles. Now we look at water. Uh, so loose soil, easy to flow, high permeability, high flow, high uh, hydraulic conductivity. Same way you have uh, dense soil, low permeability, low porosity, low hydraulic conductivity. So conductivity is a function uh, first of the, the fluid uh, property and also the soil property. 
has a minus sign for a reason. Uh, we will discuss that how uh, it looks uh, by looking through the uh, equation of uh, hydraulic conductivity uh, and the experimental setup as done by Darcy himself in the following lectures. Uh, for before that, we'll uh, finish the microscopic and macroscopic view. Uh, so, what is a ma macroscopic view? Is a solid view. Okay, it is combining all these small particles into one unit. That is a, a tube. Uh, you are not looking at soil individually as soil particles, but you are looking at soil as a tube. Okay. And in the tube, I'm passing water. Uh, Q discharge goes into a cross section A at a average linear velocity v meters per second and it comes out however if you take the uh, macroscopic view out and put the soil in a for example microscope to look at the microscopic view you would see water slowly going through and not straight in a macroscopic view you cannot see the water movement you assume that water is going straight okay but in a microscopic view you can actually see that it is not going straight but in a torturous way or meandering way and it is variable velocities here the velocity on the top of the tube is the same as the velocity at the bottom of the tube Whereas here you have a velocity moving up, velocity moving in the in the middle section and on the end sections at different velocities. Uh, this is the key understanding between the macroscopic, uh, which is also the Darcian view, and the microscopic approach. Okay, uh, Darcy found experimentally that the discharge Q is proportional to the difference in the height of the water, hydraulic head between the ends and inversely proportional to the flow length, okay, which is L between the length. Uh, and we will look into detail on how this experiment was set up uh, along with how this equation was arrived in the following. I would like to stop today's lecture. Thank you.